Hi, and welcome to today's video. Today we're going to be looking at grinding wheels. Grinding in the home shop is always a little mysterious. It's something we don't hear about that often. We know it's good for very accurate work, but how exactly does it work? So we're going to be looking at grinding wheels and how to select the proper wheel for a job. I mean, in other words, what are the variables that I can play with? And we're also going to be looking at how they wear down and different approaches for cutting. So let's get to our video that's all about grinding wheels. Several things can affect the finish that you obtain when surface grinding. The most obvious thing that can affect your finish, well, is wheel balancing. And, well, we already have a video for that, so you can go and take a look and see how to balance a wheel properly. The second would be a poorly fixed part. Now, obviously, if your part vibrates on the magnetic chuck, well, you're going to get a very poor finish on the surface that you're trying to produce. The 123 block project, its third video, talks about a part stability and shows a technique for making sure that your first cut is done on a stable surface. And there are four other obvious reasons that can affect how your part is held on the magnetic chuck. And the first of those four other reasons would be defects on the surface of the magnetic chuck itself. And those can be taken care of by stoning the chuck or by surface grinding it. The next most obvious would be dirt or debris. It's very important that everything be very clean. The next two reasons will have to do with part thickness. Obviously a thin part is more prone to deformation during machining. Now if you're grinding a thin plate there's a good chance that it's going to banana up while you're grinding and obviously that becomes a rocker. The last of the two thickness reasons has to do with the magnetic field. The magnets on your magnetic chuck form short magnetic fields that are actually loops and the height of those magnetic loops are about a quarter of an inch. Parts that are thinner than the height of the magnetic field well, just won't be held that well. And remember, I'm going to add one on on the end just for safety. That if your part is higher than it is wide in any direction, it needs to be supported by very accurate blocks. The next most obvious reason for poor finishing while surface grinding well, would be shot spindle bearings. And you can check that with a dial indicator and you can check for the specs of your machine with the manufacturer. The next most obvious reason, what would be the use of an inappropriate grinding wheel? We have many, many types of grinding wheels. We have these metal diamond grit cutting wheels, and they're generally reserved for cutting ceramics and carbides, very, very hard materials. We have these fibrous grinding wheels that are tough as nails and are made to be abused, but they're not very accurate and they don't cut very well. Actually, they heat more than they cut. And they're reserved for rough grinding jobs with angle grinders and that type of equipment. And then we have these aluminum oxide wheels that we're a lot more used to seeing. The first thing that we notice about these aluminum oxide wheels is that there's a color difference. This one is dark gray, this one is white. The color has to do with the purity. The dark gray is a less pure aluminum oxide and it makes for a much tougher grain. So this will be used for deburring and is the type of wheel that we often see on pedestal grinders. Whereas this white grinding wheel is quite pure. It's a lot more delicate but a lot harder and it's particularly good for cutting very hard materials such as tool steel. Something that needs to be said about grinding wheels such as this one is that they are not cut from the side of a mountain. They are manufactured and that means that every aspect of their composition is done for a reason. So let's look at the different aspects of a grinding wheel such as this. And the first and most important one well, is the abrasive grain size. Grains come in several sizes. Well, we're going to simplify by saying fine, 
medium, and coarse grains. Oddly enough, grain size works almost the same way as file teeth size works. A coarse grain removes a lot of material quickly, but leaves a poor finish. Whereas a fine grain removes very little material, but gives a very high degree of finish. Coarse grains are generally reserved for very soft materials, whereas fine grains can be used, but only on hardened steels. In the home shop, you want to go middle of the road, because you don't want to be changing your grinding wheel for each job. And that means, as far as grains go, something that's in the middle of the road, and that would be a 46 size grain. And you'll see that on the description number of your grinding wheel, as the third part. So you'll have a number, one or two digits, followed by a letter, followed by a number. That second number is your grain size, and it should be 46. The next thing to consider would be the bonding agent, or what's holding those grains together. And in 99% of the cases on surface grinders, you want a vitrified bonding agent. And that means that the grains are held together by something that resembles glass. And that's why these grinding wheels are so delicate. The next thing to consider is the grade of the wheel. And the grade of the wheel is the strength that holds those grains together. Oddly enough, and this is very important, soft wheels or soft grade wheels are used for grinding very hard materials like hardened tool steel. Whereas hard grade wheels or hard wheels are used for grinding soft materials, such as mild steel. Now that seems really odd, but there's a good reason for it. There has to be a clear winner when you're grinding. And since when we're grinding tool steels on a surface grinder, we're forcing a grinding wheel into the part, if I force a little too much, I don't want my wheel to explode because of the high pressures I'm applying on it. So what I give in return is a wheel that's going to let grains go easily or wear down easily to reduce the pressure when I'm pushing a little too hard. Whereas my harder grade grinding wheels, and this is a harder grade, it could be white as well, but it just happens to be uh, grinding wheel for a pedestal grinder. Well, these harder grade wheels are used for mild materials because the clear winner in that exchange will be the grinding wheel. If I force a little too much, the part will lose its material more quickly. These hard grade wheels are usually used on pedestal grinders where the forces applied are relatively small. Well, as was the case with the grain size, the grade of your grinding wheel should be middle of the road. And the final variable we want to consider for our grinding wheel, well, is the structure. And grinding wheel structure has to do with how much open space there is between the grains. And the rule of thumb for that is quite simple. The heavier the cut, the more open the grain structure has to be. The reason is quite simple. The deeper the cut, the longer the contact, and the long contact requires space to store those chips. If you take cuts that are too deep for the structure of your grinding wheel, well that is going to pack the grinding wheel with metal, and that will definitely not give you a nice finish. And that was the variables that compose a grinding wheel. But there's one thing that we haven't spoken of yet, and that is poor technique. Now, if we want to understand how to use a surface grinder correctly, we have to understand how the grinding wheel wears when we're grinding. So let's head over to the blackboard, or in this case, the whiteboard, and take a look at that. So, I've done two little sketches. The first one here, I can see dotted up at the top here, my grinding wheel positioned that way. And I can only see the bottom portion of the grinding wheel in this sketch. And I can see the part that I'm machining. I've indicated a depth of cut of about two thousandths of an inch. And my longitudinal movement is 
this way and my transverse movement is in this direction. So I'm slowly advancing into my part as I cycle longitudinally. If I take just this corner of the grinding wheel, I've blown it up here and greatly exaggerated it. I can see that I have my two thousandths of an inch depth, the one that I have here, and my corner. And I've exaggerated this so that you can see what happens when it wears down. So I'm going to draw some wear lines on my grinding wheel. And each line that I'm going to draw represents about 15 to 20 longitudinal passes. In this example, we must also remember that each pass that we take longitudinally is accompanied by a movement that advances the transverse feed by about 10 or 15 thousandths of an inch. So, that represents the wear on the grinding wheel. And everything on this side of the last line that I've just drawn is gone. It's not there anymore. Now when that wear gets to about one-third of the width of the grinding wheel's face, it's time to redress the wheel. But remember, your grinding wheel has two cutting edges on it. And since in the transverse axis we can cut coming and going, well, we can wear both edges down by one-third and still cut properly. Another thing to remember is once you get close to that one-third of a width in wear, you're going to hear a difference in the sound of your grinding operation. And that's due to the fact that the surface contact between your grinding wheel and your part is getting bigger and bigger. And that means that there's more and more pressure. And that means that the more you wear down your grinding wheel, the faster it's going to wear down. So now we've seen how a grinding wheel wears down. And we know that if you work too harshly, you're going to wear down your wheel quickly. And a worn wheel just won't give you a nice surface finish. So what can I do about that wear? Well, first and obvious thing is redress your wheel. But dressing the wheel takes time. And you don't want to do it continuously. So, instead of dressing often, it's better to reduce the rhythm of your machining. Reducing the rhythm of machining means three things. It means reducing your depth of cut. Taking less off is rarely a problem. Taking too much off can be disastrous. The second would be cycling the table in the longitudinal axis quickly. If you cycle slowly, you're transferring a lot of heat to the part and encouraging a lot of rubbing and a lot of wear. So you want to move quite rapidly. The third is the transverse movement. We want the movement to be quite slow. Each time the wheel cycles back or forth once, we want to advance no more than 20 thousandths of an inch. And you don't want that transverse movement to take place when the grinding wheel is above or on the part. You want it to take place when the grinding wheel exits each end of the part. So, for surface grinding, slow and delicate is always better than rough and fast. And to everyone, happy machining!